So That's every great. year when I do this uh, seminar, I try to reflect on the previous year's work, uh, and that typically encompasses uh, in our in our field three major uh, meetings. One is San Antonio. One is, of course, uh, 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 ASCO, and then the other one is ESMO. It's been very fluid within breast cancer this year because of the virtualness of the meetings and data has been kind of streaming out at random times and not necessarily at big meetings. So uh, I forgive me if I've left something out that you think is important, certainly ask me about it, but I'm gonna highlight some of the things I thought were potentially practice changing or aha moments for the year. A quick uh, note on disclosures. Uh, I do have several relationships and I will point one out later on again as I discuss some of the data from one of these companies. Uh, early stage breast cancer, I'm going to think about this um, as we all think about it in sort of three to four subsets of disease, a hormone positive, HER2 negative, then the uh, HER2 positive space, and then triple negative space. And we'll look at uh, some innovations or thoughts in each one of these. I'll jump right into it. And this is probably truly the hottest off the press information you're going to find and truly the most impactful of the types of research we're going to see in terms of the sheer numbers of patients that are going to be affected by this work. Uh, I'm going to start with first a negative trial, and then I will present what will be uh, considered a positive trial. To level set, and I understand there's some breast cancer experts watching this, uh, but there's many uh, folks who are generalists. Uh, I think most of you will know at this point that in early stage uh, breast cancer, people still have recurrences. Our job is not done. So when we look towards the metastatic setting, we have had this uh, truly in a, uh, humongous innovation in terms of CDK4 inhibition. We know now that it's uh, more than just standard of care, but life-saving for patients who are uh, diagnosed with early state uh, with metastatic breast cancer that's hormone receptor positive and HER2 negative to somehow incorporate a CDK4-6 inhibitor. There are three of these molecules on the market, abemacyclib, uh, palbociclib, and ribociclib. Uh, they have slightly different chemical structures and slightly different in, uh, ability to inhibit their targets, either CDK4 and CDK6. But for the a large part, when you look at the data in like versus like studies, the hazard ratios for these drugs when combined with endocrine therapy versus endocrine therapy alone, that can be either an aromatase inhibitor, tamoxifen, or even uh, drugs like fulvestrant, the hazard ratios are very consistently about the same. And, and, uh, and now we're starting to see early data suggesting overall survival benefit in a variety of different contexts. This has, of course, led to the FDA approval of all three of these agents in a variety of different contexts in that setting. Uh, in general, the drugs have an acceptable toxicity profile. So whenever drugs look that beneficial in the metastatic setting and look safe, our job is then to see if we can find a role for them in early stage setting. So this is the first of these trials. There's three gigantic trials being done. Two of them have now been presented. It's a randomized phase three trial of palbociclib with endocrine therapy. It was presented by Erica Meyer uh, in Berlin while she was in Boston virtually uh, two, weekend, two or three weekends ago. So this is the study, and I'm going to highlight a few features of this study. It's a stage two, uh, uh, they generally invited stage two to three patients. Um, many of them had completed a prior therapy and were at the time of um, randomization had gone through the bulk of their therapies, kind of when we all typically start endocrine therapy within six months of that uh, other therapy. Uh, they all had to have blocks because there was something called the trans study to do downstream um, correlative analysis. And then there were some stratification features, as you can see, and we'll focus on that a little bit. It was a one-to-one -one study, a very simple trial. RMA uh, was with the investigational agent plus endocrine therapy on a monthly cycle with three weeks on, one week off. So this is a very conventional way in which we use this drug. And RMB was endocrine therapy alone. And you can see uh, there was some latitude in terms of what the endocrine therapy could be. Overall, the primary endpoint was invasive disease-free survival, although a number of other endpoints were baked into the, to the analysis. So the trial accrued pretty quickly for a large trial. Uh, and they, you know, Erica point, and Dr. Mayer pointed out that they generally focused on higher stage disease and had received prior chemotherapy. They, by their uh, sort of metrics, qualified folks as having 60% of them having clinical high-risk disease with either more than four lymph nodes involved, or if they had one to three lymph nodes, they had T3 or T4 disease or grade three disease. So if you look at this, 
it is one of these studies that we would candidate, qualify as well balanced, but if the devil's in the details here. So I will point out that a fair number of the patients, over half of, or about half of them, or more than half, were N0, N1, and then a fair number of the patients, more than half of them, again, were T0 to, uh, sorry, T0 to T2 disease. And I know that we can qualify these folks as having clinical high-risk disease, but we know from other studies, such as the MINDAC trial, that maybe 40 to 45% of these folks really actually have low-risk disease based on molecular uh, biomarkers such as gene expression assays. So already, even though they've classified these patients as having clinical high-risk disease, the biology underlying these diseases could be a little bit more mild. And, and we're not really capturing it because of the way the, the study was um, designed and run together. I'm just uh, laying down some crepe for later that'll, that'll become relevant. So at the interim analysis two, uh, they had 351 invasive disease uh, uh, free survival events, and that was what they were looking for. But unfortunately, there was a futility boundary that was crossed. Uh, they stopped the trial. Folks that were still on PALBO were removed, and then they're now everybody's moved into long-term follow-up. So what does the curve look like? Um, one of my dear colleagues, uh, Keith, ben, uh, Keith uh, Eaton, uh, lung cancer thoracic oncologist, would say, this line, these lines are so close together, you can't get a piece of paper between them. And that's essentially what we're seeing here. The invasive disease for survival, but also the distance relapse free survival, there's no discernible difference. Uh, when you look at the, the actual rates, 88% for this endpoint, 89-90% for this endpoint, um, and um, there's nothing more to say. This is at uh, 24 months of follow-up, and there's no significant difference at this point, and it's unlikely that any significant difference would ever appear in this particular trial. So that's the PALA study, and when you look at the different subgroups to see if we can figure out if there was a group that benefited more than another, at least based on these clinical factors, there is none. All these lines are very close to unity in this forest plot, and they all uh, widely cross that barrier. So there's no subgroup that was identified as um, any signal, at least based on clinical parameters. As I suggested, uh, they do have this trans palace study, and I suspect they'll start um, looking more deeply at the tissues to see if there's some other molecular markers that might determine some hint of benefit for some group. But then that would only be hypothesis generating at this point and not really lead to any um, opportunities for palbociclib in this space until additional studies were done. So this is the, the data for palis and palbociclib. But then at the same meeting, uh, this data was presented and was then co-published the same day in the JCO with abemocyclib in essentially a very similar study design but with a very different study population. So let's look at this a little bit more carefully. So again, hormone receptor positive, HER2 negative, may characterize high risk as more than four lymph nodes positive, or if you had one to three lymph nodes positive, one of the following had to be also the case. So T3, grade three. And then this is a bit problematic because they wanted centrally tested KI67 of greater than 20%, and I'll touch base on that again. Here are some other characteristics. They were finished most of their therapies in the other study and then uh, randomized one-to-one, -one, so a very clean study. And here, um, unlike palbociclib, which can really affect your uh, bone marrow function and has to be dosed three weeks on, one week off, abemocyclib is daily therapy uh, uh, for every 28 days, all 28 days, twice a day. And then uh, the other group was standard of care therapy with endocrine therapy. And endocrine therapy, again, was physician's choice. Here, again, invasive disease-free survival was the main endpoint, but they had a bunch of other endpoints baked in. When you look at this study, um, again, it's one of these well-balanced studies with uh, similar groups on both sides. So uh, not an uncommon group of individuals for us to take care of. A fair number of women were premenopausal, so that's also a high-risk feature. And then prior to treatment, uh, several of these patients had disease that was, quote, bad enough that they needed preoperative therapy, so 40% of the patients in this, care, in this case. So this is already looking like a more high-risk patient population and a high-risk presentation. When you look at the disease and the clinical factors in particular, you'll see that uh, one to three lymph nodes are positive in about 40% of the patients, but more than four lymph nodes in 60%. So already you're seeing a shift compared to PALIS in terms of higher risk. And then within this group, you're going to see, um, you know, a nice spread between things, but uh, um, this, is all, this is what the other 40% look like. 
when you uh, look at this one feature, which is something that, as you know, in the United States is not reported on our synoptic pathology reports, but is very institution specific because there's not agreement around how KI-67 should be assessed. Um, you know, you can see centrally that uh, there's a lot more higher risk here. 44% uh, of the folks had this high turnover type uh, uh, tumors, highly proliferative tumors. So already just looking at the details here, you're getting a sense of more high risk. And then, uh, and by es my estimate, I will say that, you know, this is some back of the envelope calculations. If we were trying to figure out like what the genomic high risk percentage versus low risk here is in the first trial, I'd estimate about 40% are probably going to be genomically low risk based on something like the mammoprint print test. Here, just by my back of the envelope calculations, it's going to be closer to 15 to 20%. So fewer truly low risk people probably being involved in this study. And because of that, uh, abemocyclib had a positive trial. You can see here uh, in the um, full uh, y-axis that um, there's already a, a difference that's emerging with the events. It's uh, highly statistically significant and represents a 25% reduction of invasive disease-free uh, survival events. Uh, numerically, that's only about a 3.5% difference, but we're still at only two years of therapy, and there are actually people still on therapy with this trial. When we do the blow up to look at this in more detail, here's what this looks like, this 3.5% three, three absolute difference. When you look at the subgroups, unlike the prior trial where every single bar uh, crossed the line of unity, you're starting to see some subgroups that are looking like they benefit uh, here. And it's a more consistent to the left favoring the combination therapy uh, uh, compared to unity. Than, uh, than the previous trial where it was truly uh, on either side. And you can see that some of the benefits was, looks like, you know, early assessments here, look like the higher risk your clinical disease was, the more likely you were to benefit from this therapy. Uh, I will point out toxicity here because this will be a drug that um, probably will get to the finish line with the FDA with a new indication. Uh, and you can see that um, there were no new toxicities that emerged in this study. Uh, really, these are toxicities we were aware of with the bemocyclib in combination with endocrine therapy. The biggest one, of course, is uh, neutropenia, uh, sorry, is diarrhea, with a fair fraction of folks suffering from grade three events. I think even since the advent of this study and our sophistication managing other molecules that now cause diarrhea, we're likely to do a better job with this than they did on the study as we practice our routine daily medicine, I hope. Uh, neutropenia was not um, uh, unheard of in the study, but in terms of serious neutropenic events, it was very low, only seven, per, uh, seven patients, 0.3 patients who had uh, febrile neutropenia. So just to, before I jump to the next topic, I, I think when we look at these two, uh, Monday morning quarterbacking on these studies, trying to figure out what's going on, uh, there's some takeaways that could be had. One is you could say, oh, palbociclib just isn't as good as a democyclib, but that's counter to the evidence that we see in the metastatic setting. My bias is that this is all due to the study design and the types of patients on the study. There's a clear higher risk kind of patient uh, characteristics to those on the monarchy study with the democyclib, and that might explain the difference between these. Um, I do think just editorially, uh, this molecule is probably something that's going to get to cross the finish line of the FDA and probably get approved. But, um, you know, we don't do things like check KI-67s and so forth. So we'll have to see what the label actually looks like at the end of the day. Moving on, I just wanted to give two slides to this uh, presentation from ASCO, which is the breast cancer index. Uh, so the level set on breast cancer index. Uh, I think many of you know that uh, based on the our early breast cancer trialist cooperative group uh, assessment of all these adjuvant trials published in the New England Journal, we know that even after five years of endocrine therapy, uh, substantial numbers of women continue to have recurrences. Most of those recurrences happen to be determined by your original diagnosis in terms of the stage and, and the severity of the presentation. But even in the lowest risk groups, there was ongoing risk of re recurrences from years five to 10 and then even beyond. Knowing that, we've been doing studies now for a number of decades, two decades, looking at extending endocrine therapy beyond five years to 10 years and sometimes carrying over the same endocrine therapy, for example, tamoxifen after tamoxifen or switching endocrine therapy, such as an aromatase inhibitor after tamoxifen. Uh, but also trials where we just continue an aromatase inhibitor for the full 10 years. And uh, knowing that 
the vast majority of patients don't benefit from this strategy. We've been in search of a biomarker that might help us identify who they are. So across all of these studies, it's a pretty fixed but small percentage, about 5% who seem to benefit from disease-free survival events or metastatic um, survival events from years five to 10 when we use these interventions. So that one way to put that is that there's a number needed to treat of one in 20. But when you look at the number needed to harm in terms of events such as um, fractures, uh, endometrial cancer, DVTs, depending on the agent you're on, the number needed to harm is actually worse than one in five. So uh, we, we have this difficulty or challenge of then saying, okay, you need this drug, but we're also gonna continue to put you in harm's way with a variety of different toxicities, but also just quality of life issues. So we've been in search for a, a tool that can help us do that. And maybe BCI addresses that. So they have now at this point, what would call, qualify as level 1B evidence based on two retrospective trials, showing that tamoxifen after tamoxifen, or in some patients, or uh, an aromatase inhibitor after tamoxifen has some value when you have what's called a high risk score on the BCI test. So what these guys did is they looked at the ideal trial, which in the parent study, had folks who had initially been on tamoxifen and AI or this, done this switch strategy were randomized to either two and a half years of letrozole or five additional years of letrozole. And they looked to see, knowing that the parent trial showed a very modest benefit for this extension of 10 years, to see if they could identify which patients they were. And so they got um, a handful of blocks from this trial, and they show that in the unselected overall population, the 10 versus seven and a half percent, there's a 5% difference. But when they looked at the folks who had a low score on the BCI test for this difference, there was actually no difference. It was essentially the lines kind of crisscrossing over each other. However, when they focus on the folks who had a high score on this BCI test, you see a nice difference emerging, roughly a 10% benefit, so a rough doubling of the number of patients who would benefit from this uh, intervention if when they were identified as high risk. You may argue this is a um, you know, how is this relevant? You know, we don't, already we don't do seven and a half years standardly, but this, I would take this as saying, this is evidence for underestimating this difference because if you compare this to five years versus 10 years, perhaps this number is even greater. So I think we do now have, and this is again, I'll point out in a high risk group, 73% of these were node positive patients, but a fair fraction were node negative as well. So I think we do have now a third trial that uh, adds more weight to this test as something we can use to identify patients who might benefit from extended endocrine therapy. So that's the portion on ER positive disease. I wanted to bring up a few trials in triple negative quite quickly. This is another study presented by a Chinese group at ASCO this year looking at Cape Cytobine as adjuvant therapy in triple negative disease specifically. So again, to level set here, uh, doctors Masuda and Toy in the New England Journal, but also at ASCO a few years ago, showed that in patients who had achieved no PCR, non-PCR status after preoperative pre therapy were still at high risk for recurrence. And they randomized these women to receive Cape Cytobine versus not for a year. And while there was an overall positive uh, result for that trial, the third of the patients who had triple negative disease drove almost all the benefit in that trial. So the talking points among sort of the experts was in triple negative disease with residual disease, uh, after preoperative therapy, think about adding Cape Cytobine. But that was based loosely on one study, and we kind of need more robust evidence for this. So this Chinese group uh, took patients, the vast majority of whom actually got adjuvant chemotherapy, not preoperative therapy, with triple negative disease alone, uh, with these disease characteristics, were randomized one-to-one, -one, a clean study, uh, with uh, a low-dose uh, Cape Cytobine regimen versus observation. So this roughly calculates, I would think, in a Chinese population to probably somewhere between 1,000 to 1,300 milligrams um, daily, twice a day. Uh, and you can see the characteristics of the patients. Some, some you know, tilt towards low risk, but certainly plenty of folks with high risk uh, clinical presentations. And this is what their study uh, endpoints look like. The primary endpoint was DFS, and you can see a 10 percentage point difference. It was statistically significant in a small study. Uh, when they looked at overall survival, while numerically different, uh, it did not cross statistical significance. I don't know that this is fully um, baked. As you can see, the, the, you know, the lines start to divide at uh, roughly 30 months, and perhaps with more time, this look uh, more profound. But for the time being, they report a DFS result uh, that is uh, meaningful. And further, I think, uh, points out that Cape Cytobine really does have a role in the adjuvant care 
of triple negative breast cancer. There's one caveat here, of course, is that both of these studies were done in a Asian population, which may actually have different results um, when translated to a more Western population. So um, last year at ESMO, and then again at San Antonio, and then in February of uh, this year in the New England Journal, Peter Schmidt and his colleagues um, presented the Keynote 522 trial, which is a trial looking at pembrolizumab when added to preoperative therapy for triple negative breast cancer. And they stratified for patients who are PD-1 and PD-L1 positive and negative. And if you will recall, the differences in those trials were pretty uh, profound. Uh, the pathologic complete response rate in the group that got Taxol plus uh, the carboplatin with pembrolizumab followed by AC plus pembrolizumab versus placebo, there was a overall PCR rate of 65% versus 51%, so a 14 percentage point difference. And then when they looked at the PD-1, PD-L1 subsets, it was essentially the same, although in the PD-L1 negative uh, group, the numerical achievement of pathologic complete responses were lower. And then when they looked at more late meaningful events, there was already a 4% difference in things like disease-free survival that were emerging, and that was also significant. So that was published in the New England Journal. So now we have Impassion 031 presented at ESMO, looking at atezolizumab plus chemotherapy in the same population. So this is a small trial, 333 patients, all with triple negative high-risk disease. Uh, they were stratified by pd one status. And then, um, you know, you can see it's a very neat study. One thing that's notably absent here is carboplatin. Uh, this is with NAD paclitaxel and atezolizumab. One other thing that's notable is this is a Q2 week uh, regimen and Q2 week regimen with the AC portion, whereas with the other study, it was Q3 week um, and, uh, uh, so just uh, more in line with how we might practice in, uh, in the United States. And then after surgery, uh, ongoing atezolizumab uh, treatment. Uh, this is, a quote, a well-balanced study, but you will see in the placebo plus chemo, there's a couple problematic things I see. Uh, slightly higher percentage of worse performance status in this group. Slightly higher uh, percentage of black patients, although overall representation of black patients in the trial is pretty paltry. Uh, but this is a little problematic because black patients with triple negative disease do have more severe um, manifestations and presentations. And then also more node positivity in this group. Uh, you know, at the end of the day, these may wash out, but it, it is interesting that three things that we know to be bad prognostic indicators happen to be enriched on the placebo side. So this is just the flow chart, and you can see at median follow-up 20, 20 months uh, and, and roughly the same number of patients left on study. And this is the main endpoint. So I'll point out uh, these numbers are numerically a little bit lower uh, in this trial. So this was in the PEMBRO trial was 65%, here's 58%, for example, but a 16.5% difference in the group for all patients for this achievement of a complete pathologic response. When you look at the subset that was PDL1 positive, these numbers go up, um, but still maintain this robust difference between the two groups. And then, like the PEMBRO study, even in the PDL1 negative group, there is a difference here. Uh, again, undermining the message that PDL1 is probably the most important thing uh, in, in assessing uh, for whom this drug works. Uh, we still need a good biomarker, and, and it's probably not uh, PD1, PDL1 staining. So one last transition here, uh, I'll present one trial on early stage breast cancer in the HER2 positive uh, population. This is uh, the Caitlin trial. Uh, it's a phase three study presented at ESMO of adding TDM1 in the adjuvant setting compared to uh, our standard, which is trastuzumab and pertuzumab with taxane uh, after anthracycline in the adjuvant setting. So you might ask, why am I presenting this? And it's interesting, you know, we're trying to figure out where to use TDM1 in the adjuvant setting. In the United States, such high-risk patients with these characteristics here are typically treated with preoperative therapy. But around the country, around the world, and uh, other places, you will see more of a, an approach where surgery is completed, and then we're left uh, treating these patients with um, adjuvant therapy solely and we don't have the benefit of uh, pathologic complete response to guide us for whether or not TDM1 should be used in the adjuvant setting as we would do uh, based on the Catherine trial. So here's a very neat study, large number of patients, 1,500 or more of them having node positive disease, so truly a high-risk group, 
randomized to answer cyclines uh, in the, both cohorts, but in this group, a standard approach with a taxane, trastuzumab, and pertuzumab, uh, and then versus TDM1 plus pertuzumab. This is what the primary endpoint of invasive disease free survival is. And you could say, hey, this is another negative trial. There is no difference between these two lines, uh, 94 versus 93%, one percentage point difference. And overall, the message that these folks are generally doing well with 6% or fewer patients more than five years out having an event. Uh, but you can look at this uh, quality of life uh, issue here, which is once patients had completed anthracyclines and baselines were set at 1.0 for a uh, proportion of folks having any deterioration of function, you can see there's an initial rapid deterioration, but then the lines separate. And for all points going forward, as far as three years out, you're seeing a difference between the tolerability and, and uh, performance of patients who are randomized to uh, CAD silo or TDM1 plus pertuzumab. And this is also observed for physical functioning, role functioning, and cognitive functioning. So we have a drug here that while it doesn't push the envelope in terms of efficacy, it's clearly uh, easier to be on uh, according uh, to this study and, and these patient uh, assessments of function. So takeaways from Chicago and Berlin and all, all done virtually from home. CDK4-6 inhibitors plus endocrine therapy may have a role in the prevention of IDFS events in early stage breast cancer. Right now it looks like abemacyclib is the winner, but is it really true that it's a better molecule? My bias is that it's probably the study. Uh, Palace honestly had probably too many low risk patients and obviously they're gonna continue to analyze those specimens from both trials to see who is most likely to benefit, especially in the setting of having modern molecular markers such as gene expression profiles to help guide that, something along the lines of uh, mammoprint, for example. I do think BCI is an emerging role, but maybe an established role as an assay for uh, considering extended endocrine therapy. I will note that I've spoken for this company before, so please keep that in mind as I make that statement. Impassion 031 confirms improvement of PCR endpoints with the checkpoint inhibitor. In this case, it's a tezolizumab here misspelled, but also I think we're seeing with the pembrolizumab. There is again, de devil in the details in terms of the study design, but here you have a situation where regardless of the changes and differences in study design, we're seeing very similar findings. So this uh, makes me more confident that a checkpoint inhibitor may have a role in early stage triple negative breast cancer. And then finally, I think we have uh, further evidence that Cape Cytobine is, does have a role as an adjuvant therapy for triple negative breast cancer and sets a benchmark against which we should compare our other therapies. And then finally, TDM role, question mark, question mark, question mark, another role in adjuvant therapy to spare toxicities. Uh, at least we have it, you know, help rescue folks who have residual disease um, after preoperative therapy but one could argue, at least on the basis of tolerability, may have a role here as well. And this is again on the heels of the TDM1 trial, the ATTEMPT trial, which was presented at San Antonio showing in very low risk cancers. There was a numerical improvement in disease-free survival events, but a substantial improvement in patient perceived toxicities with TDM1. Thank you very much. I think I'm on time for a change and I will cede the floor back to the next speaker.